means for the midmost point of my perineum, right, halfway between my rectum and my penis, right in the soft part of the perineum, the floor of the perineum. I don't mind talking about this point because it's a really important point for sciatica, for example. But if you drew a line between my ankles and the feet, whether I turn out a little bit or not, that's personal, so it doesn't hurt me. Through the core of my body, approximately four fingers in front of my spine, not in the center of my spine. Your spine is not the center of gravity of your torso. Anybody who's ever told you that is ridiculously uninformed. As soon as you put your center of gravity in your spine, you're falling backwards. Can't be done. It's actually slightly in front of your spine, anterior to the spine. That's where the center line is, and then it comes up through the core of your body, just in front of your spine, toward the front of your throat, actually very close to where the omohyoid and the voice box are located. That actually makes sense. If you put your hands right here on the omohyoid, that's your Adam's apple. <laughs> Guess what? Girls have them too. It's, it's a ridiculous myth. Girls don't have Adam's apple. Omohyoid. Bum. Yes, they do. Okay, go ahead, put two fingers right on it. All right. Now just do this. Say, now just do this. Now, now just do this. this. You feel that? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's drawing energy right up from the ground. And then, boop, out the top of your head. Center point on your head. If I draw a line from front to back, from the hairline straight to the back, and from the back side of my ears, if my head is not tilted forward across to make an X, that point we call by hui, that point, also known as the crown chakra point. But it was called by hui a long time before it was called crown chakra point. Because it's where the golden thread exits that comes up from here. Okay. Now the trick is all the energy natively that's working in the world is traveling from the core of the planet earth to the sun and back and forth so the the primary line of energy exchange in our world that we happen to live on is between the center of the sun and the center of the earth yes there are other energy lines but that's the primary line and if you are on that line, you are powerful. And if you are not on that line, you are not powerful. To whatever degree, you are off of that line. So another thing Bruce Lee used to say, yeah, Bruce Lee knew this. Bruce Lee thought about this. He would say, aside from, you know, being in a good place in your life, the next step is to get on the line. Because if you're on the line, you're strong. And if you're off the line, you're weak. Now, he didn't invent the concept. It wasn't his concept. He learned it from Yip Kai Man, his teacher. And Yip Kai Man learned it from my pot boom, big bushy eyebrow man. <laughs> okay? And it's a Tai Chi concept that's taught in Bagua and Singi. Bagua being like combative Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chan Fa, it's called. And Sing E being really badass Tai Chi. <laughs> Other broken bones involved in Sing E. <laughs> De death touch and broken bones. And, you know, those guys are wicked. First lesson, get on the line. If you're on the line, you're strong. If you're off the line, you're weak. Okay? Pu Tai Suan, who I wrote, I put on the board, was also a martial arts school. I told you. Our school, our clinic, our medical school trained the king's bodyguards. You might say, why would a bodyguard need to know healing arts? Well, I wouldn't want a bodyguard that didn't. What's the point? Every bodyguard worth their salt is trained as a paramedic. I have students who've worked as professional bodyguards. Every single one of them is trained as a paramedic. Why? Something happens to their client. They're the first on the scene. While waiting for our ambulances and while waiting for that, they have to be expertly trained med uh, medics. 
That's a traditional skill for bodyguards, real ones, not like, you know, in the movies. Get on the line is a martial arts concept. Get on the line is a healing arts concept. Self-focus is a martial arts concept. Self-focus is a healing arts concept because it gives us a faculty both to observe and to relate to the client that we don't ordinarily have and it gives us a way to relate to the client as a relationship that does not take away from us. See, no matter how much I try to pull energy off that golden thread, I can never deplete it. Because it represents a twin polarity between the earth and the sun, and on that level of tapping into the energy and depleting it, I don't count. I can't impact it or change it one way or the other. I'm too just too small. So well, all I want to do is get in the way of it. If I get in the way of it, then I am strong and I am powerful and I have a virtually unlimited energy. And to whatever degree I'm off that line and I'm not utilizing this as the core principle of application, I am weak and I am tired. And I will be broke down and busted in no time whatsoever. And guess what? This is what leads to burnout with healers and therapists. Because they don't understand where the energy comes from. How many energy workers I've talked to don't know where the energy comes from? Oh, from the universe. I'm like, the universe? No, wrong. I mean, in a global, let's not be very precise kind of way. It's from the ground. First, why would you say the earth is on our life? comes from the earth first. Our material self comes from the earth first. Innervated with the twin polarity of give and take the love relationship between the earth and the sun. Stand up. I want to do a demonstration because I gotta make it concrete for you. I know. And it's not enough for me just to say it. I want to make it concrete. Everybody gather around. Come on. Come on over here. This guy is fun. Standing good, you're good, got a good standing there, you like go like this, you're not just gonna teeter over and all that. Pressure of intention. Pressure of anticipation. Okay? Now, without touching my hand, put your foot over. Well, first of all, how about, are you straining right now? Are you okay? Don't, don't lock your hands up. Just stay like this. Alright. How do you feel? Are you okay? Could you stay there for a little while? How long could you stay? I can bet. I mean, and even saying, I'm I, wanna, I would allow you to shift your foot, and, you know, to be comfortable, but how long could you stand on like that? Conservative. Three minutes. Oh, God, I was. <laughs> I could stand like that all day. When I was in the Air Force, we had to. I guess I've been in band, so yeah, I guess I band. can't, it's band. I can't I stand in for a while. Now that I, I was in marching band, oh my God. Waiting for a parade, waiting for, oh my God, in full, da, 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 and I'm percussion, remember. So I'm schlepping, so 
here. Okay. So can we just say he's not working too hard right now? If this was his therapy practice, I think he'd be pretty good to go all day. If this is what he had to do in his therapy practice, okay? Hold your foot over. Now you're going to have to adjust because you're not going to balance. Don't touch it. Just hold it over. He's working a little harder. But I'm going to give him a little hand. Put your heel down. But still don't touch my knee. Okay, now how hard are you working? You could probably do that for hours, right? If I was with many different people, no problem, all right? Now just ease your foot forward and touch my hand. Don't put any, oh, just touch, don't put any pressure on it. So he's got about a gram or two of pressure on my hand. How much is that hurting me right now? Okay, ease forward and put a little bit more pressure out. How much is that hurting you right now? now? How long could you do this? How many times a day could you bring pressure like this to bear? Always. Ease forward and put more pressure on that. That's a mountain. Ease forward, put a little more pressure on my head. Now, considering you're starting from a static place, you're not used to probably even balancing while you're standing. Okay. I want you just to ease forward and put more weight. Put half your body weight on my hand. Just shifting. By shifting, look up, don't look down. You know that that squirmy thing under your foot is my hand. You don't have to look at it. Have a nice, neutral, natural posture and breathe normally and naturally. He's got 50 pounds of pressure on my hand. All right, keep rocking forward. Don't look down, but just rock forward. More. How much do you weigh? 170. Okay, about 150. All right, ease forward until you can raise the back foot and balance on my hand. Go. Here we go. I'm there. Raise oh. your back foot. Oh, all the way. Raise. Get it on there. How much do you weigh? 170. All right, the effort he has right now. It's the effort of balance. See, because he's not been practicing his balance. It's a little deficient there. But he's got roughly 170 pounds of pressure. Now he's back, touch your down, back foot down, come off easy, come back to neutral, come back to standing. And my hand therapeutically has had the therapeutic pressure of hundreds of pounds of pressure per square inch. Now, because it was a broad, deep, and general compression, it didn't hurt anything and it didn't break anything, even 170 pounds. It only takes 8 pounds of pressure on a 1 inch square surface to actually break any bone in the human body to cause a fracture. Now, granted, that's not static pressure. It has to be an impulse or it has to have a twist or rotation, a push or pull. But if it has uh, any of those criteria, eight pounds will do it. You can break any bone in the human body, fracture, including the pelvis, with eight pounds of pressure. And that's that's one that's so easy to prove, I don't even want to go there. Because I can just take a five pound sledgehammer. You're starting to get my dread. There's a five pound sledgehammer and just drop it on your foot and break bones. I just drop it from a foot. I don't even have to go three feet, four feet, five feet. Just take a five pound sledgehammer and just, boom, it's done. Probably break one of those little bones on the top of your foot. If I did it to your hand, there's a good possibility I'll break your finger. Just five pounds, 170 pounds, okay? Now the next thing is, through squeezing and muscular strength to create 170 pounds of pressure on a body part, you have to be Herculean. We're talking power lifter. An Olympic bar on a standard Olympic weight bench weighs how much? Just the bar. Somebody tell me. 45 pounds, exactly. Okay? One plate, one full size plate, 45 pounds. 
right? So one plate on each side, 90 pounds, plus the 45, which is the weight of the bar itself, brings us to 135. 80% of the population cannot move that bar 10 times. 80% of the population can get on a bench and do a full bench press with an Olympic bar with 245s on it 10 times. He just put 170 pounds on my hand and did not appear to be training for the Olympics. Right? In fact, he could have spent the time he was working on me having a cup of tea. Checking his Facebook. He was using so little energy to bring all that pressure to bear that he could have actually have been had energy to spare, even attention to spare. But now let's just say hypothetically, he gives me the attention. So he has reserves. So if he had to do that to me 500 times, who cares? He might break the sweat. If he had to do that all day on pressure points, quote unquote, energy lines, pressure points, postural points, and so on, all day long, if he did it that way, then he could do it all day long, sun up to sundown, and at sundown, he'd be ready to go out dancing. Energy to spare. So when you watch the old it's one reason I like to go to the rest, you can say. One reason why I like to go to the rest. One reason why I like to go to hill tribes. One reason I like to go to the villages. And what is what? Because I spend time, I hang out with the old people. And I watch how they work. And 50% of the time, at any given time of the day, the therapists look like they are about to take a nap. Or they are just about to wake up from one. That's how hard they're working. Nobody's hopping. Nobody's puffing. Nobody's red in the face. 50% of the time they look like while you are done under pressure. Because your body doesn't know that that 170 pounds that he just applied to my body didn't cost him anything. My body doesn't know that. My body thinks you're putting that pressure on me. That is freaking for real. That's what my body thinks. This is how an Aikido master can toss a 200 pound man 12 feet through the air with two fingers. It's because he doesn't generate the power to do it. He draws the power. This is how Bruce Lee could do a one inch punch and take a 250 pound man standing in brace, fifth degree black belt off of his feet eight feet through the air into a chair, which then flips over backwards. And all he did was, boop. He did not generate the energy because if you do the math, you can't. So the, according to him, and I was taught this technique from, not from Bruce Lee, but from Danny Santo, Larry Hartzell, Tim Tackett, and Richard Bustillo, Alfonso Tomez, and Jeffy Mata, that's who taught it to me, was my crew of teachers, Francis Vaughn, David and Joe. I'll show you a picture of all of these guys sometimes. It's great fun. What they were taught by Sibu Lee was that the, the power always comes from the earth, always comes from the ground. And it's a two-way circuit. The sky lifts, right? It's not compressing you, it's lifting you. It's pulling you up. And the earth is grounding. But the sum of it is, if you're in that circuit, there is a tremendous, literally infinite amount of energy that's moving through that circuit at all times of the day or night. And so, as in traditional Thai medicine, what is considered a good posture or a good application it's defined by where does the power come from for the application. If it's muscular strength, then that's a beginner move. That's 
not very expert. Doesn't matter if it looks the same as what the expert is doing. See, this is the thing about Bruce Lee. You know, Bruce Lee was, all, was exactly the same height and weight as Paku Samaya. And I found this out when I invited Danny Osanto. And you probably don't even know who Danny is. But anyway, when Bruce Lee died, he had uh, four schools and about 100 students, uh, subscription students. Between those four schools, about 450 active students on subscriptions in four physical locations. And when he died, Linda Lee gave those schools to Danny and Larry Hartzell and Tim Tackett and Richard Bustillo to take over and run in the absence of their teacher, Sifu Lee, which they were already doing anyway, because by that time he was Mr. Big Movie Star and wasn't actually in the school very much. Okay? So they were already running the Shindig. Those schools are still in existence. They still run today. They're still there. They're still happening in Torrance, Culver City, Seattle. They're still happening. The concept was you draw energy from the environment. In Bagua, they do a form. They call it five element form. And you draw energy from the five directions, which you then uh, do internal circulation between the six hollow and the six solid organs in your body. But first thing is always that you get on the line and you gather the energy. And then you circulate the energy inside and then you project. And when you project, it is, I won't say it's effortless because man, I have sweated my butt off trying to master some of these concepts. I'm not, I don't want to lead you to believe that the practice path is without effort. It's just simply not true. But there are these little rewards where you find yourself doing really, really big things with very little effort. Maybe hardly even any. And the first time it ever happens, it will surprise you. First time that you put your hands on someone and instead of you pushing them, you channel the energy, you facilitate it, and you get motion, and you get movement, and you get a dramatic response, it'll blow your mind. It'll freak you out. Be a little freaky. You'll be all like, oh, I had one student come up to me and describe one of the first times that this experience happened to them, and ask me if it was satanic. The day it called their preacher up and asked them, well, I hardly did anything, and there was a major correction, and bones were aligned, and circulation was improved, and they were swollen up with edema like a balloon, and in 10 minutes, all the swelling was gone, and I hardly did anything. And they called the preacher up and asked if it was satanic, and he said, yes. <laughs> and then, well, yeah, only Jesus can heal. You can't heal. So if you did the healing, it's got to be Satan. End of discussion. But then she called me. And I went, well, let's do a high five on the phone. <laughs> and she goes, what do you mean? I go, well, you finally did it right. At least once, that's a start. <laughs> now figure out how to do that with everyone all day. Now you're getting it. It's starting to make sense. Where at the end of a session, you have more energy than when you started with. Now it's starting to make sense. Because now you're in it. Now you could actually survive in a working clinic with lots of sick people. And you wonder how they do it. I'm, I'm telling you how they do it. Okay. Now, um, you are a good volunteer. Let me have someone else here volunteer. Uh, prone position. First person on the map. So, back to this idea of Tadasana, okay? First of all, when I go to put pressure on the body, if, I, if my posture is this in preparation of putting po a pressure on his body, literally, I didn't actually put pressure on his body. I actually, if you really wanted to break the motion down, I fell on top of it. Because I was my, so far forward, off center, that by the time I got my foot in motion, I had to put it down somewhere. 
So if I had to put it down, I couldn't have stopped this far off of the leg. I wasn't in control of the motion. Okay? So the trick is, is you want to be in control of everything you do at all times. If you move fast, move fast on purpose. If you have a ballistic motion, then that ballistic motion is consciously in, in tension. Okay? However, what you don't want is a ballistic motion because you're out of control. Hold on, hold on. It won't last long. You'll be fine. <laughs> now, so when I'm watching you walk on the leg, that's kind of what I see. Because I see that the pressure application is really uh, out of control. It's, it's really slow motion falling. Like falling in slow motion. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. The first thing is, turn the supporting leg out. They can't be both turned the same way. Because that's like standing on a balance beam or on a two by four or on, you know, I'm not a gymnast. I'm not trying to do gymnastics here. I'm just trying to do what in ballet is called look first position. And there's a reason why look first position is first position in ballet. There's a reason. And the reason is because you can lift a foot by adjusting your center of gravity without looking down at your feet. Because uh, I've never trained in ballet, but I've been I've worked on a lot of ballerinas and both men and women. Okay, and I've gone to performances many times, and I've gone to practices many times. And oh my God, if you were looking at your feet while you were trying to work out a routine, you would be crucified. Because if you're looking at your feet, you are not projecting. Okay? So we stand up, relax, and then just have your foot up, and then lightly place it with no pressure. Lightly place it with no pressure. And then to create pressure, I have a center line, imaginary point in the center of my chest, which I just move forward. When I have this shift, this point forward, just a few degrees, proportional to the shift, he has pressure. I don't have to look down to see what part of the leg I'm on because I know that lumpy thing I'm on is my client's leg, I can tell. And actually, the more I work like this, the better my feet become like eyes, like they have little eyes in them, okay? So they know what's going on. So I want to be heavy, I just think by projecting myself forward in space. And then, and I might exhale as I come in too strong. I might inhale as I release. And then at the balance point where my foot is free, I just slide to the next point. I don't lift it up, I don't move it. I slide, what? Uh, continuity. Shift and back. Shift and back. And if I look down, see already I have a weight load on the foot and I haven't even started. And the only way, if I'm bent over like this, and if you saw my posture from the side, right, you know that probably doesn't look like a very good posture to be in all day, okay? The only way I could move my foot to the next point is this. In slow motion. So that means there's a ballistic motion with a lot of weight and it's not in control because I can't, I cannot incrementally adjust. What if as I'm applying pressure, he tells me not to touch the body part because maybe there's an undisclosed issue with the body part. This could be anywhere on the body. How might he tell me that there's an undisclosed issue that we are only now discovering as I'm putting my foot on his leg? How might he tell me? Try it. Ouch. Ouch. Oh, sorry. What, what was that? I, heard, I was hardly touching that. Is, it, is there something going on there or are you just a wuss? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, you said ouch because when I put my foot there, you felt pain. And what is that? Why, why is that? And then you'll tell me a story. Oh, 
Well, when I was in the motorcycle wreck the day before yesterday, which I didn't tell you about on my intake form, I landed on my ass on that side, and it's got actually a pie-shaped bruise bigger than my head right there. Do you want to see it? Of which, of course, I would go, yeah, darn straight. That sounds fascinating. I would love to see that. But if I'm throwing my weight, and there's a big bruise there, I can't stop. He goes, ouch. The other way, how, tell me some other ways he will tell me if, if there's something wrong there, like a big bruise or an injury or a hematoma or a flinch. Flinch is a defensive reflex, but what flinch is? I put, well, first of all, the tissue under my foot will short. That's a defensive reflex. Cringe reflex, also we call it. But the tissue under pressure that feels that the pressure is adverse, too pointed, too specific, too hurtful, shortens to resist the pressure. And then from that point, it spreads. So there'd be a shortening in his lower back. He might draw his shoulders up. His hands would close. His feet would close. Maybe his toes would grip. Very often, he'll raise that leg. Because when he raises the heel on the side I'm touching, go ahead and do that. See, first thing I feel is the shortening. But what it does, though, is it changes the nature of the pressure. And it gives him a distraction. So he might raise his head. He might yell, ouch. He might cringe and flex and reflex. He might grit his teeth. Even if he's, you know, thinks he's, he's supposed to be tough. So he's you know, not going to scream in pain because you know, he was taught that somehow if you scream when you're in pain, then that means you're cross gender and it's not a good thing. You know what I'm talking about. So he grins and bears it, but it's not a grin, it's a grimace. If I'm using the soft focus, I see this shortening wherever it comes from, top to bottom. And guess what? I read every point in real time the same way. As if I was watching a monitor that's showing not only the pressure gradient that I'm applying, but the, the receiving of the pressure. Broad, deep, non-specific compression like we're doing here standing on the leg is the best way to bring a lot of pressure to the body that ordinarily you could never do with your hands. Okay. Broad, deep, non-specific compression draws less defensive reflexes. It, does, it doesn't set off all the alarm bells that a smaller surface pressure does or a pointed surface pressure does. The ow reflex when you bump into something sharp when you're walking through the woods and you're not sure if it's a brush, a stick, a spider, thorn, or a snake. <laughs> you don't know. You react first, ow. And then you look at them like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just a twig. The one I'm telling you for. You know, and off you go. Okay? So what you do is you rationalize the reaction, and over time, you react less, which means that you receive more. Okay? So when we're walking, and then the other thing again is back to this. In this posture, oh my God, I can do this all day. All day. Next. Okay. All day. How about them bears? We can argue over sports while we're doing this. Okay? But actually, if I have focus, and instead of taking that extra attention and spinning it off out in space, and I'm using a soft focus to monitor what's happening with the client, then I can, over time, see patterns of flow of the energy in the body of my client, and I can react to them in real time in ways that don't cause me stress. Now, the trick is, in all the postures that we're doing, is to try and find this place. Even if the pressure is off the line, there's a way to do it. 
and we use some leverage to transpose energy from the vertical to the horizontal. And we can do it. Again, Tai Chi is based on pushing and pulling. Fundamental skill of Tai Chi. I mean, yeah, there's warding and great, you know, fine techniques of grabbing the monkey's tail and, you know, so on and so forth. But fundamental skills in Tai Chi are pushing and pulling. Okay? The fundamental skill in what we're doing is pushing and pulling. The trick is trying to get a conception of where the energy comes from that we are using to push and pull with. And to do so, whenever you feel you're straining or whenever you catch yourself in a posture that looks like this, while you're trying to do some sensitive work on the client and you look like you're like a, doing, uh, uh, what is it called, a rope or a wire? trapeze, you know, you look like a beginner on a trapeze half the time while you're working, okay? Just pause, just stop. And wherever you're at, just go, wait, I don't think this is right. And what you do is, first thing is, try to find a way, if you're standing or kneeling, find a way to get your hips under your shoulders. And then get your head on top of your shoulders. Half the battle will be won if the first thing you do, kneeling, sitting, or standing, is stop looking at what you're working on. Because as soon as you're not compulsive with the fetish of lookery, the fetish of lookery, the glancing fetish, you can split it up, instantly your posture improves. Instantly. So I'll give you one, one last kind of the high point. There are many high points about posture. I talked about the center line, okay? I talked about you bring pressure to bear that already exists. I'm not creating the pressure, right? That's the energy line between heaven and earth. I'm just getting in the way of it, and now I'm bringing it to you, okay? No different if I was doing Bruce Lee fighting method. I do the same thing only with another intention, okay? But the mechanics are actually identical, and they always have been, all right? Um, here's another one. All right, let me have another volunteer real quick. Anybody? Anybody? First person on there. What's that? Yep. <laughs> we got a theme going. Let's, let's stick with that. All right, pretend my hand is my foot. I'm gonna, just going to have to do that. Uh, already I know some stuff about him. See this? Comparison, A to B, right to left, reflected in a right here, reflected in a right here, reflected in a right here. Uh, now, he, this, is a, this is nothing personal. You need some work. Mm -hmm. And you know that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Again, soft focus already. I got a book full of information, right? Another time for that story, right? So let's pretend. All right, now, um, we know there are energy lines in the leg, okay? Energy lines in the leg. Big ones and little ones, right? And that's actually what we're doing when we bring pressure to bear is we're working on the energy lines. The difference, like some people want to know, what's the difference between Thai energy work and Shiatsu? Or Thai energy work and Ama, or Tween A, okay? And here's the difference. Shiatsu is point-centric. You release points on meridians to affect change in the organs. Ama and Tuina are identically the same because Shiatsu comes from Chinese Ama, which comes from Tuina and vice versa. Okay, so you have acupuncture points, acupoints that you put pressure on, which attenuate energy in meridians, which changes energy, hopefully, if you're doing it right, in organs. That's the most fundamental change that you can do. Tai, hmm, not like that philosophically and theoretically. In Thai, we have sin lines, and there are marmas on the sin lines, and there are five points 
almost equally distributed between every major joint in the body. So if you look on the acupuncture chart, you'll see there are clusters of points on the meridians. Like sometimes there'll be two, three points are right next to each other, and then there's like a gap. And there's no points, and then there's another point, and then there's a gap, and then there's a bunch of points, and that's the way meridians and acupoints are distributed, not evenly. The nadis have a very even distribution of points. So, but what's most important is the lines themselves, the sen lines, we call them. The sen lines attenuate the chakras, and the chakras have elemental dispositions. So each chakra being a composite of multiple elements, okay, of the five doshic elements. But the way we bring the changes into the chakras and also affect, quote-unquote, the doshas is the intermediary is the elements. And the way we affect the elements directly is with pressure on the nadis. So what I'm doing is like a guitarist plucks a string and the whole guitar resonates. But you can hold one note or one chord on the neck of a guitar and you can play that string, that note or that chord in three feet of neck. In other words, you can play the chord up here, 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 way down at the bridge. Now, you get a slightly different frequency on the chord, depending on where you play it. But what's important is the strings vibrate. Maybe one string more than another string. That's what a chord is. The posture is the chord. The posture is the chord. The lines are the strings. So, I can plug that energy line string in this way, way down here, right here, right here, right here, right here, and get essentially the same resonance in the core of the body, in the particular chakra that relates to the line. It's actually not so important. Tai Wei, what is each individual point? From Shiatsu, Tuina, Ama point of view, all of the points are everything, actually, points are everything. Bubbling, spring, babbling, broke. Very important. Beautiful spring, but very important. Jumping pivot, one of my favorites, jumping pivot. I love jumping pivot. Okay, we're gonna get into the points. Really, so much fun. Okay. Sidebar, you wanna see jumping pivot? Watch my hand. See that motion? Thumb? The point jumps under my hand when I rotate the leg. Brilliant. So much fun. Okay? Now, so here I'm going to work the line. And let's say there's five points from here to here. This is called a marma. Okay? Uh, it's a little bit confusing, and, and granted it was for me when I was first introduced to it, that a marma is both a point and a region of the body. The regions are determined by the center point of the joint above and below the line. So this is a marma, this is a marma. Okay? Five points on, on whatever line I'm working here, five points on whatever line I'm working there. The foot itself is a marma. Five points on five lines on the bottom of the foot, okay? Uh, there's kind of a repetition involved in this. Keeps it easy to think about. But all right, now, so we imagine the line. We imagine five points on the line. And technically, if I put my foot on the line, I might be covering one or more points. It could easily be two. Do you understand that? All right, now. Can I actually see the points I'm working on? No. 
Why do you look at your, why do you look at what you're doing when you're doing what you're doing on the body? Why, why do you do that? You're working a point and you're staring at the back of your hand. Yes. Because all you can see, when I look down, I can't actually see anything but my hand. So 99% of the time I'm working on you, I am staring at my hands. If I'm looking at my hands, if I'm trying to see what I'm doing. A lot of times students will use that phrase to say, oh, you can sit up. The students will say, no, 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 the reason why I have to look is so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, but I mean technically, can you? No matter how hard you stare, no matter how intense your focus or gaze, can you actually see the point under your hand? You can imagine it. But why sacrifice your posture for imagination? Because posture aberration has real work, real world consequences. First one is stress distortion patterns based on bad posture that are cumulative. Cumulative. You do therapy with bad posture and if someone did uh, stop action photography of you from when you first started to five years later to ten years later, you could see the crepitude come into your body. You can see shoulders rise, head drop. You can see formation of military neck. You can see chronic distortion of rotation in the elbows leading to tennis elbow, carpal tunnel. You can see inflammation beginning to develop and hypotrophy as body parts starting to swell from overdevelopment of muscles in the shoulders and in the subscapularis and in the scalings of the neck and in the forearm muscles into the thenar eminence of the base of the thumb. And over time, if you did the stop motion photography, you could see how you started out on year one as the bright, able healer and 20 years later, you're a patient. Chronic decrepitude. Repetitive stress injury. Chronic decrepitude. Um, according to American Massage Therapy Association, not my words, theirs, the average massage school graduate starts to show the first signs of occupational disability within three and five years of graduating from school. I know. You know, they publish stuff like that. People are just like, yeah, whatever. Eh, it won't happen to me. Eh, it won't be me. Okay. And yeah, well, but your opinion is worthless. And there is no long term tradition of massage therapy or anything like it. There's no long term studies. I am older than massage therapy as an industry. So how long could the study be? Four teachers from 1760 to me. Four teachers, longevity ones. We have assistant instructors who are not even called masters who have been practicing every day in clinic for 55 years. We have practitioners in our school who have been practicing for 60 years years, 70 years, and are still able-bodied and not decrepit and not disabled and not, and I'd be happy someday to take you and introduce you to that. They're inspired. So he asked me, do you know what, what is functional? What is medicine? And I go, okay, I'll bite. What is, what is medicine, Floyd? Grandpa Floyd, what is medicine? And he goes, it is to make you able to walk on the earth as an upright, two-legged human being is supposed to walk on the earth. That's it. 
So, for example, in the crow way, what he would say is, we look at you and you are crooked. You're not upright. And when you walk, just to watch you walk across a field or walk from your car or walk down the road or walk, it's obviously, it's obvious you don't know how to walk upright. You don't know how to walk. Most people, when they walk, look at their feet. Next time you go out, next time you go to the mall and watch people walking around, hurry people, people in a hurry, look off in the distance because they're projecting themselves to their destination. But they lean into it. So there's a ballistic element of leaning, this anticipation. And if they had to stop on a dime, they wouldn't be able to. They would trip and fall. And people get hurt like that all the time. He said, to, to enable you to be able to walk upright as a two-legged human being is supposed to walk upright. And so in our tradition, in the crow medicine, I'm what's called a pusher. Okay? So what does a pusher do? A pusher looks at a person to see are they upright or not. Now, guess what? If you're upright or not also involves me making a judgment of character. Because if you're crooked inside, you're crooked outside. How about that? In some subtle way. Because that's the way it works. Inside is outside. Outside is inside. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. <laughs> Inside is outside, outside is inside. If you're crooked inside, if you're not right inside, something will be not right outside. And a person with training and, and the inclination to use these observations they've been taught can see it a mile away. You can tell if someone's wrong walking down the street, across the street. Literally, if you can see them, if they're within that distance and you can see them, you can tell. I can walk down a beach and I can tell how the people walking ahead of me in the beach, that they're not well. Both by what they look like and what their footprints are doing in the sand. They don't know how to walk. Their gait is not steady. It's not consistent. One foot's doing one thing, one foot's doing another. There's no evenness in the stride. There's a heavy footfall on the heel. They, there's a heavy footfall on the edge of the foot. And in Native American way, they said that you could track a man in the woods and you could tell if he was weak or strong or sick or healthy by, the, by his footprints on the ground. Just the same way that you could tell if the elk you're following is young or old or strong or weak or sick and it's gonna be suitable for you to chase down by looking at the trail, looking at the feet print on the ground, you could tell. In fact, they would oftentimes select the buffalo in hunting because the crows were the buffalo hunters. They were actually the Indians that snuck up on the buffaloes and did all that, and they taught people how to do that. But they would oftentimes select the buffalo they were gonna kill as an old and sick one before they saw the herd. That's the one. Because the herds in the old days spread out over miles because there were millions of buffalo. It's hard to imagine. There were millions. And so when the herds moved through an area, you can imagine how it would dare up the grass. Right? They would find the track of the animal that they wanted to hunt before they laid eyes physically on the herd. And then they would follow that track into the herd, which might spread over several square miles to find that animal that they're going to ask to give up its spirit for them so they can take it home to their family. And then they would go into the herd and they would take that animal out. And they didn't choose the healthy females and they didn't choose a lot of the animals because they didn't want to cause harm to the herd. 
but they needed to have what they needed to have. And so there's like quid pro quo, but it wasn't willy nilly. Like you just run up on a herd and pick out the nearest animal that you can see and try and kill it and hope for the best. That's not actually how it went down. There was a lot of ritual involved. Quite often they would fast for three or four days before they would go out on the hunt and they would ask the animal to reveal itself to them. How big is it? What is its color? You think all buffalo look alike? I can tell you because I've been in buffalo herds that they don't. They're as distinctive as dogs or any other animal. Every one of them is completely, utterly different and unique in personality from every other one, just like every other kind of animal is. And so the pushers, we applied those same skills to people. That was our tradition to look at the person and see, are they crooked? Are they upright? When they walk, do they walk like a two-legged? Or do they walk like a four-legged? See, when I look at a four-legged and the way they walk, that's natural to them and that's really healthy. And like when Maggie runs across the yard, she's got the funniest run. I just giggle every time I see her run. It never gets tired so. Because she's made for it, obviously. And it's a joy to watch her move. She's real fast. But now if you run around all bent over, as you go through your day, all bent over, twisted up, bent over, kind of on three legs sometimes, kind of on four legs other times. And one. See, that's not right. And you can see that a mile away, much less on the map. And so what we would do is, is see what's crooked and then push or pull until it's as uncrooked as it can be. It's upright as it can be, push or pull, okay? And that's not just the body I'm talking about. In other words, if your distortion is emotional, then we push and pull on the emotions until we get that worked out. If your, your problem is mental, a lot of people have some bad thinking, <laughs> have some wrong thinking, cause them a world of pain, a world of suffering, a world of hurt, both for themselves and for everybody around them because they are just wrong. Well, traditional medicine man or woman, they would work on that also. They would give you something to think about that would be what I call a self-correcting paradigm of intellect and mental gymnastics. I'll give you an example of this. They might take you out and have you do a vision quest, which is um, basically, it's just a fancy word um, uh, for fast by yourself in a place where if you scream and cry, nobody's gonna care or hear you or care if they do hear you, okay? Because before it's over, you're gonna do all the above. And then what they would do is, they would take you to the sweat lodge before the vision quest. I did this. Take you into sweat before the vision quest, and then the medicine man or woman, that's both men and women, because they would tell you what you need to think about on your vision quest. Vision is not imagination. A lot of people get confused. They think vision is imagination. No, no, no. Vision is actually being able to see.